I want you to picture the prayer of our Lord tonight like a mighty river. Picture that prayer of Jesus that you heard. All the prayers of Jesus, for that matter, can flow on into this river. Picture it as a mighty river flowing on from the day that he first prayed that prayer on down into our world, and that river is going to flow on to the end of time. And you, you can picture yourself as a little barge. I was going to say a little stick but we all want to be bigger than we are. So picture yourself tonight as a little barge floating along on the prayer of Jesus. That's the truth of how things are. We aren't just engaged in fanciful thought when we think that way. Truly, what holds us up, what carries us on, the current that keeps us on our path is the intercession of our great high priest. This part of John's gospel has been called the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And I think it's kind of obvious why, isn't it? This is what priests do. They intercede on behalf of others. They are the bridge builders, we might put it, a building a bridge from earth up into heaven. And that's what Jesus is doing in his intercession for us. John 17 gives you that current of the river of Christ's prayer. All that he could have said, he has said around the table. You remember where it all started, right? He washed their feet. He gave them that new commandment that they love one another as he loved them. He spoke in warnings and promises. He spoke of a vine and branches. He spoke of his departure and of the Spirit's arrival. Everything that could be said had been said. Everything that needed to be said was said. What was left for him to do? Well, at the end of the meal, at the end of that supper, we find Jesus lifting up his eyes into heaven and lifting us up to his Father. He lifted up his eyes into heaven and prayed. And in that prayer, you hear our Lord speaking these wonderful words, praying for himself, for his apostles, and for all who will believe through their word. That includes each and every one of you. This prayer of Jesus encompasses not just the people then and there, not just the church in the early ages, not just the church in the middle ages, not just the church in the late ages, but it envelops and surrounds and upholds and carries on our church as well. This prayer of Jesus, this prayer of Jesus really is the mighty river of salvation that pushes us along. But think tonight a little bit about the act of praying. Prayer is a rather presumptuous activity. We presume a lot of things when we pray. And the first thing that we presume is that the world is not a machine. If it was, what would be the point of praying? If everything was just mechanical, if there were a bunch of laws that were governing everything, the sun rises because of some impersonal law and the sun sets because of some other impersonal law and everything happens according to some mathematical formula, there'd be no point in praying, would there? But of course, that's not what the world is. Here's how a great Lutheran pastor puts it. He says, the world is not a machine, it is a creation. That is, reality around us is the thoroughly and continuously dependent product of a personal free will. In any moment, the world is and is what it is only because God wills it to be and to be so. Why was the wind blowing today? Why was the sun the exact temperature that it was? Why was the light just the way that it was? Why is the dusk like it is? Why do the stars come out in the patterns that they do? Why does any of this stuff happen? Sure, there are laws of nature. There are principles that we can discern because God's will is consistent. Think about that when we're thinking about something like the eclipse. We're all excited about the eclipse, and all of a sudden, everyone is a mini astronomer, right? All of a sudden, we're saying things like, well, this hasn't happened in five years, and it's not going to happen again for 50-something more years, right? All of these consistencies in our world are there because God wants them to be there. All of the discoveries, all of the formulas, all of the things that we come up with to sort of figure out how things are in the world are there because God is consistent. 
But what that means, what that means is that we aren't surrounded by a machine. Here's what that pastor said. He would go on to say, he says, we are enveloped by a dancing multiplicity of mysterious realities. It's not a machine around us, it's a dance. Isn't that beautiful? The dancing multiplicity of mysterious realities. Of course, if you use big words, everything sounds cooler. But that is way cooler, isn't it? The world is not a machine that's just sort of going on. The world is the product, it is the creation of your Father. And when you pray, when you pray, you are presuming that he actually wants to hear from you. That the one who orchestrates this dance of the sun and the moon and the stars and the seasons and the light and the rivers and the oceans and all that good stuff, that he actually wants to hear from you. The world is, in turn, enveloped, this pastor goes on to say, by a personal freedom. And that freedom, God, is open to you. Now, that's why we pray, but it's also why Jesus prayed. He prayed to his Father, not because he needed to just fill some time, not because that's just habit, what you do at the end of a meal. I can remember as a kid, we'd go to family gatherings, and we'd always pray before the meal, and that made sense, right, because nobody could start eating until you said the prayer. But then sometimes we would try to pray afterwards. Have you ever tried to pray with a bunch of grandchildren after the meal? Good luck, right? So what my grandma suggested, she said, how about instead of praying before and after, We just pray the after prayer before. You get two prayers at the beginning. Thanks, Grandma, right? But Jesus finishes the meal just the way he started, with prayer. Prayer can sometimes feel like a sort of useless activity, right? What does it really do? Because we think of the world like this machine that's just happening. But when you remember that the world around you is the creation of your Father, and you have access to the one who controls it all, then your prayer is no waste of time. Jesus' prayer certainly was no waste of time. He's not just filling space because, well, this is what we do when we are all finished eating. No, from this prayer, a mighty river flows on because the Father loves to hear from all of his sons and daughters, but especially from his beloved Son. And so the things that Jesus prays for in this prayer, you know, don't you, that God the Father says, yes, my son, yes, my son, yes, my son. So what does he actually pray for? There's a lot of words on the page. Hayes read a lot of things tonight, and we could go through and we could probably spend time tracing out how this prayer of Jesus connects to like everything in the creed, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, his session at the right hand, the sending of the Holy Spirit, the creation of the church, and it'll go on to the end of the world, but that would take too long. And so tonight, just notice the three things Jesus prays for, the three people he prays for. First, he prays for himself, then he prays for his apostles, and then he prays for you. Now, it might seem odd that Jesus prays for himself. Sometimes people tell me, Pastor, I never pray for myself, and I say, well, you should. <laughs> you know, but we think, right, we have this sort of false humility, like I shouldn't pray for myself. That would be somehow selfish or wrong. Well, Jesus does it, so you should too. Whether you think you need it or not, you should pray for yourself. And what we hear Jesus praying for himself also kind of strikes us as odd, doesn't it? What does he say? Father, glorify me. Wait a minute. Are we allowed to ask for glory? See, we hear that and we think, well, glory means fame. And is Jesus really praying that God would make him famous? Jesus doesn't want to be a celebrity, does he? He's not interested in fame for fortune or something. That's true. But when he says, Father, glorify me, hear it this way. He's saying, Father, lift me up, elevate me. And of course, when you hear that, you know what that's a prayer for, don't you? Jesus is lifted up on his cross When he says, Father, glorify me, he's not saying, you know, get me out of this tough situation. He's saying, put me in the tough situation. Put me there on the cross because when I am glorified, then you are glorified. 
and then all of my people are glorified. This prayer for glory is not a prayer for greedy gain. It's not a prayer for selfish fame. It is a prayer for, well, what did he say? The salvation, the eternal life of my people. That's the glory of Jesus, not to suck it into himself, but to pour it out to each and every one of you. So he prays, glorify me that you may be glorified and that my people may be glorified. And then he goes on to pray for his apostles and for his people after them. Now think about what that requires. We call this intercession when you pray for someone else. If you were to go home tonight and you were to try to remember, who did I see at church today? Who can I pray for? And maybe a a picture comes into your mind and you actually know the name. Aha, I remember that guy's name. In order to pray for that person, you have to kind of identify with him or her for that matter, right? You have to think, what would it be like to be that person? What is he going to need? What is she going to need? Well, Jesus does that when he intercedes for his apostles and when he intercedes for you, he identifies with us. The letter to the Hebrews puts it this way, we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with us. Jesus sympathizes with his apostles and out of that sympathy, comes this beautiful prayer. He says, Father, keep them in your name and keep them from the evil one. Now just think of how important that was for those apostles. Those apostles faced things that we will not face. Those apostles faced an intense kind of persecution that none of us are going to face, no matter how much we're sort of belittled or mocked for our beliefs. They faced life and death, didn't they? They faced a persecution from their own countrymen, from their own kin, that none of us are going to have to face. They needed that prayer of Jesus to be kept in the Father's name, to be kept from the evil one, to be sanctified in the truth. This is what I mean. Because of that prayer of Jesus flowing like a river on through the world, the church grew. The mission of the apostles succeeded. The faith was passed on from that generation to the next one and on down the line to you today. It's all because of this intercession of Jesus. Keep them in your name, protect them in your truth, dear Father, and keep them from the evil one. And then thirdly, we hear Jesus praying for those who will believe through the word of the apostles. That's all of you, right? That's all of us. In the same way that he sympathizes with his brothers, with his apostles who are around the table in the upper room, he now still sympathizes with each and every one of you. There is not a single one of you in this room who Jesus doesn't know and sympathize with. There is no one in this room who is too insignificant for Jesus. Well, I don't really care about them. Jesus is not like me, right? I say things like this all the time. I'm not really interested in the details. I'm a big picture kind of a guy. Jesus is detail-oriented and big picture. And what that means is that he is able to sympathize with every single one of your weaknesses, whether they be little or big, whether you are young or old, whether you are simple or very intelligent, Jesus is able to sympathize with any of you, and he prays for you. He prays for you. And what does he pray? He prays this prayer for you that they may be one with me as I am with you, dear Father. That's an amazing prayer, isn't it? That they may all be one, even as we are one. Jesus prays that we would be united to him individually and collectively. Jesus prays that there would be nothing that divides us from him. Right? He's not praying for a superficial kind of unity. A lot of times, churches, denominations will use this verse in a very superficial way. We should all just get along. Right? Have you heard this? We should all be one. We shouldn't have any doctrinal disputes. We shouldn't argue about anything. We should just kind of put that aside and all just agree. Agree to disagree. Well, ask yourself, is that the way Jesus and his father are? Do they sit down at the table and say, now, we're not allowed to talk about religion, we're not allowed to talk about politics, we're not allowed to talk about anything important, we're only allowed to talk about the weather and uh, March Madness. (laughs) 
The unity that Jesus prays for is not superficial unity. It is that we would be united in the truth, that we would be united all the way with him, that our wills would be aligned with his will, that our life would be aligned with his life. And to show you what that means, to show you what that means, look what your Lord is willing to do. Look how he has united himself to you. He hasn't come into this world and says, I'll handle one of your problems and you keep the rest for yourself. He comes and he says, I will bear every one of your sins. I will die your death. I will be put in your tomb so that you may receive from me every good thing. He takes everything from you and he gives you everything that is his. He gets your sin, you get his righteousness. He gets your death, you get his life. He gets all of your uncleanness and you get all of his holiness and glory. That's the unity that Jesus prays for. Not a superficial thing, but the unity that saves. That's a beautiful prayer, isn't it? That's the kind of river that you want to flow with, right? Don't fight against it. Sometimes if you go down to the Ohio River, you'll see those tugboats churning and churning and churning against the current, right? How much better would it be if they just turned around? I know they can't do this, but, you know, if they could just turn around and just float down the river. That's what our calling is, to not swim against the current of Jesus' prayer, but to flow with him, to go where he goes, to follow his example, to go where his prayer calls us to go to. And when you do that, when you do that, then instead of fighting the current, you learn to go with it. You learn to go with the words of your Savior, Jesus Christ, so that finally you will come to the day when the river opens up to the ocean. And how is it that Jesus put it? That they may be where I am and see my glory and know the love that the Father has had for me from the foundation of the world. That's where this river is headed, dear friends. Don't fight against the current. Go with the current. Let yourself be pushed on by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Let yourself be pushed on until you come to that wonderful vision, that wonderful vision of his glorious love. To him be the glory now and always. Amen.